Charles Ives, Connecticut Yankee insurance man and composer, born 1874, died 1954, wrote his fourth symphony during World War I. It waited 50 years for its first complete performance by Leopold Stokowski, the American Symphony, and the Scola Cantorum. This premiere NET telecast of Charles Ives' Fourth Symphony marks the culmination of 15 years' labor on the score and half a century of anticipation. Following the opening prelude, before the full symphony is heard, Maestro Stokowski and others involved in preparing this extraordinary work for public performance will speak of its special place in American music. This symphony is such a revealing self-portrait of the composer. His humor, his love of flexible rhythms, of the sounding together of different harmonies, and his delight in distant sounds and close sounds. Just as we all know, when we hear 
a military band go by. It makes a crescendo towards us, gradually fades away in the distance, and another one comes along. There's a certain moment when they're in different keys and different rhythms. It, for me, a magical moment when they're blending together. And Ives apparently loved that very much. So he has in this first movement a distant choir of two solo violins, solo viola, and solo harp, contrasting with the near instruments. Besides Maestro Stokowski, those involved in preparing this performance included Ron Herder, editor-in-chief, Associated Music Publishers, Stuart Warkow, manager, the American Symphony Orchestra, David Katz and Jose Cerebrier, associate conductors, and Elaine Jones, timpanist, the American Symphony Orchestra, and John McClure, director of Masterworks, Columbia Records. Like Leopold Stokowski, John McClure has been an Ives fan for many years. Well, my first contact with Ives' music was when I was, I think, in my 20s or late teens, and I came in contact with the Kirkpatrick recording of the Concord Sonata on a Columbia record long before I ever worked for Columbia Records. And uh, this was like the uh, first shot of heroin to me. I became hooked thoroughly on Ives. This is the first time this symphony has been performed because it has taken years. When Ives died, he left this symphony on separate sheets of paper. It's taken years for several musicologists to put all that together and to try to make the complete score, and from the complete score, all the orchestral parts. This has taken tremendous labor, and it was tremendously difficult. But at last, we have it. But I wish Ives were with us tonight because there are many questions I would like to ask him. Fortunately, all those extra rehearsals that Stokowski managed to get from the Rockefeller Foundation were an uh, enormous help, because I went to all of those and gradually started to absorb the score into my own, into my own brain. I can remember sitting in Carnegie Hall doing the first run-through of the, of the fourth movement and just getting hopelessly and forever lost, and on the second run through also. This symphony, in my opinion, this score is the most difficult score I have ever studied and attempted to conduct. And because of its great difficulty, we needed extra rehearsals. Fortunately, the, there was a foundation, what's the name of the, who? The Rockefeller, that's, he's the uh, governor, isn't he? <laughs> anyway, Rockefeller Foundation were generous and gave us extra rehearsals. And in the first rehearsals, the music was so difficult, we just took it first a bar, then the second bar, and the third bar, one bar at a time, until gradually we found the sequence of it all, and now, we still have many problems in this score, in this symphony. The rehearsals did change my mind. I, uh, and, and not just the rehearsals, but the number of rehearsals changed my mind. I, we, we found out that when the thing was broken down into atoms, and each atom rehearsed separately, and then gradually put together, that the thing did take shape. And then I think we all became uh, considerably more optimistic about how a final performance would sound. And as the concert proved and the recording proved, we were, we were right. We were right to be optimistic. Because the thing does play. It does, it does make an effect. He did know what he was doing. It wasn't naivete. There's been a theory that if only he'd been able to hear performances of his work as, he, as or shortly after he composed them, that uh, he would have changed his mind about things, changed balances. And, uh, but now I think I think we're a lot less sure about that. I think I was, was enough of a genius to, to know what he was doing. It's up to us to follow and interpret and decipher. And One other thing I would like to say about Ives is 
He wasn't a professional. He was an amateur, just as was Borodin, and they were both men of genius. I know some professionals who are not men of genius. <laughs> Of course, my copy of the score looks as if it's been through the Battle of the Bulge. It's marked up to a fairly well in red and blue and green and black. And, and uh, so I doubt it could ever be used for another performance of the Ives Fourth Symphony. But what I did with it, I, I went out recently to record uh, with Stravinsky in Hollywood. I took it out to him and also an acetate of, of the recording, which wasn't yet released, and left it with him. And <laughs> I can't get it back. <laughs> he won't part with it. He's, um, he was very, very interested in it. Looked, 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 and looked, and looked at it very closely. And uh, he's now very intrigued with Ives. Another thing that amused him was the sound in the streets and the opening of a door and going into a church when it's suddenly silent and tranquil. And in the second moment, he has such a passage where the orchestra is divided into three groups. That's why he, uh, I was put into the score that he wishes three conductors. Personally, some people think one conductor's a little too much, but three is what Ives wished and it is necessary here because one orchestra is playing tranquilo and softly and slowly. Another part of the orchestra, conducted by Maestro here, is playing loud and faster and faster, and then Ives says it collapses. Sudden silence, and then the tranquil orchestra goes on. At the same time, all the percussions are playing, and Maestro cuts over there, he is conducting the percussion instruments. And these three groups are individual and different. Maestro Katz was in the percussion section and had his responsibility there because normally he does assume a dual role in performing with the orchestra in addition to being an associate conductor and personnel manager. It was then left to Maestro Cerebrier to be uh, at the front of the stage with Stakowski to work with the choirs of the orchestra over and above the percussion section. I did not have any idea of the enormity of the project, really. Uh, my thought was, gee, why do we need 10 rehearsals, you know? And I think a lot of the musicians with whom I spoke, because I do contact each one individually, also thought, well, why do we have to have all of these rehearsals? We read music. One of the great difficulties for any orchestra, and we encountered at the very first rehearsals, was to get the players to forget everything they've learned in a conservatory about ensemble, about trying to play together. Because Ives requires just the opposite in many cases. It requires that the musicians should not listen to each other, but they should play individual parts. I think that uh, up to the last minute, many of the players could not really understand what it was all about, especially since it's hard for uh, members of an orchestra to, to be able to hear the entire thing. A small group of instruments will be playing along uh, very quietly and serenely, and then all of a sudden the roof will drop in on them. The rest of the orchestra will just go out of its mind for 12 bars, and then stop, and the little group is still playing on serenely, you know, undisturbed by all this. If we had known at that time that, say, two or three conductors would be used, we could approach it in that way. But we were trying to work with the concept, is this movement performable with one man, with one leader at the helm? And of course, the answer in, in the score's original shape was no. The people that put the score together for the orchestra uh, had envisioned, for example, in several different places, having three conductors going simultaneously and we did try that uh, at several rehearsals i think the maestro uh, finally felt and i and i do agree with him that actually nowhere in the work are three conductors finally used from a musical standpoint i think the the newest ground broken by ives is the fourth the fourth movement 
That's something never been heard before. It was a whole new, enormous leap forward. And how he, how he did it, no one will ever know. It's just one of those things of genius you can't explain. Uh, less difficult from a recording standpoint, but uh, enough musical meat to chew on for 50 years more. It's a movement full of conflict and some solutions. There are obviously some philosophical ideas involved. It isn't just pure abstract music. And at the end, I think it ends with a question mark. But as rehearsals went on, we had innumerable rehearsals, uh, it suddenly began to, well, what happens is that you listen and you begin to pick out little things that are going on while you aren't playing, of course. Uh, you begin to hear the, uh, one violin playing a certain rhythm, and you, be, you begin to hear a trumpet come in, and he's playing something on top of that, and then you hear the, the woodwinds come in, and you know, like the pyramids, and you can see what he's trying to uh, get to. And my impression was that this is just like life. You know, you have many people with many ways of thinking, many ways of living, many cultures, but all of these cultures put together make for the whole of our particular society or our, our, um, our community. Charles Ives is widely known today for his music, but for most of his lifetime, his friends and associates thought of him as a top insurance man, senior partner in the Ives and Myrick Agency, founded in 1908. Two men who knew him well speak to us now. Julian Myrick, his former partner, and also past president of the U.S. Lawn Tennis Association, and George Tyler, Ives' son-in-law, now a member of the law firm of Cravath, Swain, and Moore. They tell us of Mr. Ives and of his wife, Harmony, one of Connecticut's great beauties at the turn of the century. Uh, he came into the company and the actuarial department, where you have to be very precise with your handwriting and all of that, and he, as you know, his handwriting was like a chicken scratching in the sand. You couldn't read it hardly. So he was transferred down to what the Raymond Agency, of which I was a clerk, application clerk. And uh, he took my place, and I went outside to deal with the agents. And uh, his handwriting was so bad that they uh, sent him outside and brought me back inside. So, uh, but we became friends at that time, and we remained friends uh, throughout our lives. Well, I think that uh, everybody uh, outside the immediate family circle uh, thought of Mr. Ives in the, uh, in the earlier years before he became recognized for his music as uh, something of an eccentric uh, as far as his musical activities were concerned. They all recognized uh, his merits as a businessman and an insurance executive. But I don't think that uh, people outside the, in the, uh, uh, among the relatives, outside the immediate family, uh, really took his musical activities very seriously uh, until later years. And Christmas about 1908, uh, uh, he became ill, and the manager of the clearinghouse that I worked for, a friend of ours, suggested that we go to Old Point Comfort to give Charlie a rest. And as while we were down there, that uh, we talked about uh, going out for ourselves and be establishing an agency for either the Mutual Life or some other company. Well, I think if it had not been for Mrs. Ives, uh, Mr. Ives would probably uh, have died uh, in the 1920s. Uh, he had a very serious heart attack uh, as a young man. He also had uh, diabetes and was one of those who was saved uh, from death by the discovery of insulin. Uh, Mrs. Ives had been a, a uh, registered nurse uh, before her marriage to Mr. Ives, 
And she watched over him like a hawk. Uh, and Mr. Ives uh, would, of himself, have had no regard for his health at all. And they had a very, very happy life. And uh, she had a great many bows, and she was a very popular girl with the boys, and I had plenty of competition. And, uh, and finally winning her. But it was worth the chase. <laughs> uh, for many years, uh, he refused to take any deductions on his income tax returns for charitable contributions because he felt that uh, the government should not suffer because of his charitable activities. It was only in his later years when the income tax rates uh, got so high that uh, he was persuaded that he would have more money to give to charity uh, if he did take income tax deductions. He said himself never let his music interfere with his business or his business interfere with his music. For many years, uh, he did not read any, any newspapers. And he had, this was part of uh, cutting himself off from uh, the contemporary scene uh, entirely. Uh, one time in the 30s, when I had known him for only a few years, uh, he rather startled me by asking about uh, Charles Evans Hughes, whom he had known as governor of New York and uh, particularly in connection with Mr. Hughes' investigation of insurance companies. But apparently he had lost track of Mr. Hughes, so he asked me one day, George, whatever became of Charlie Hughes? And I was glad to be able to tell him that Mr. Hughes was Chief Justice of the United States. We also asked Maestro Stokowski and Mr. McClure what they would ask Charles Ives if he were alive today. I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that question. You got another one? I don't know what I, I don't know really what, I'd be struck dumb. <laughs> I wouldn't know what to say to him. He's too, uh, he's too far beyond my, uh, that kind of genius is too far beyond my comprehension. There are many passages that I think could be clearer in balance if we could say to Ives, what do you wish to be prominent at this point? Because sometimes very important passages, like I believe in the army, in the early morning, they wake you up um, with a trumpet playing reveille. Is that what it's called? Reveille? Reveille? A bad pronunciation of a French word. All right, uh, that's what they do in the, in the early morning. And there are two passages in this symphony where the, what is it called? Reveille is sounding, but you don't hear it because the balance could be probably a little changed by Ives if he were alive to help us to make that clear. From, from listening to the music, I, I'd figure that he, the enormous, range of the man. I, I think a boisterous, and fun-loving, athletic, spontaneous uh, extrovert that comes out in his music. Uh, it's so often bumptious and raucous and fun-loving. But I think, I think that's not the main clue to him. I think also there's a, a terrible loneliness in him, uh, which comes his position in music, that he, in fact he had no one close. There were a few other composers with whom he corresponded, uh, uh, principally Carl Ruggles, who's at present preparing a, uh, a volume of correspondence between Ruggles and Ives. But essentially the, the man was terribly lonely, rejected by his time, rejected by the musicians of his time, almost never heard his works performed, and uh, I'm sure this this told on him. This uh, I, I hear in that in the music, um, a, a fearful loneliness that always underlies all the all the fun and the God bless America or the um, Columbia, the gems of the ocean and Yankee Doodles and marching through Georgia. Underneath, 
there's always a kind of a sad loneliness, distance.
NET wishes to thank Maestro Leopold Stokowski, the members of the American Symphony, the Schola Cantorum, David Katz, Jose Cerebrier, Elaine Jones, Ronald Herder, John McClure, George Tyler, and Julian Myrick for making possible this NET premiere telecast of Charles Ives' Fourth Symphony, recorded in New York City at the Manhattan Center. Editing services by Reeves Studios. This is NET, the National Educational Television Network. <laughs>